So, today I thought I'd speak on time and how Christians are supposed to use it. The topic came to me because I was thinking about how a lot of um, a lot of Christians see things and how a lot of Christians are actually using their time today. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians are in serious trouble because they are not using the time they've been given wisely. The vast majority of Christians are wasting time through going after false doctrines, through idleness, laziness, through chasing after vain and unprofitable things, through putting time and investing times in things of little or no profit, through wasting time in sin, in various heresies, and essentially it's a great shame because we know time is such a limited thing. One of the things as a Christian you're going to deal with are time wasters. And the Bible's very clear on how we should deal with them on a scriptural level. Turn to Titus 3.10. A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Again, the Bible's quite clear, after the first and second admonition, reject. Don't waste time on people who are just raising ridiculous questions, who are just not willing to learn, or not willing to accept what the Bible says, they just want to cause problems. After the second time, leave them alone. A lot of the time it's, it's a pride thing. They're not going to change and you're not going to change your stance if you're a Bible believer, so just leave it there. Turn to 1 Timothy 1.4. 1, 1 Timothy 1.4. 1, if someone could read that, please. You need to get here to great fables, endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Again, neither give heed to fables. You just go on YouTube these days or you speak to the average Christian and they get, a lot of them are getting caught up in all the charismatic stuff or the sensational, hyper-spiritual things you're hearing about. And again, don't give heed to them. A lot of them are just a waste of time if they're not lining up with scripture. And we were talking about this the other day, endless genealogies. You get some very heady Christians who are into all of this sort of stuff, endlessly studying. Um, and a lot of people are doing that purely to raise questions or to get a corner on some sort of truth. A lot of the time it's just a waste of time. And a good verse that connects with this is Ecclesiastes 12.12. 12. Ecclesiastes 12.12. 12. And further, by these my son, be admonished, for making, of making many books there is no end, and much study as a weariness of the flesh. Again, we study to show ourselves approved unto God, and work not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but you can study forever, basically. There's so much stuff out there. Just don't waste your time, and don't get drawn into those who are going to try and waste your time. Be wise, and try and discern why people are asking questions, and what they're trying to get at. Turn to Romans 14.10. Romans 14.10, the Bible says, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we, all, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And again, thinking about the topic of time, that's kind of the ultimate uh, summation of our use of time down here the judgment seat of Christ if we're saved you know we're no longer wasting time every single thing or activity that we're investing time into it all boils down to the judgment seat of Christ how is that going to appear is it going to be wood hay and stubble or is it going to be gold precious stones things of eternal value so again as Christians we've got to be brutally honest with ourselves you know We've, we've kept here for a reason. God hasn't dropped us dead as soon as we've been saved. He's got a purpose for us. So we really need to be examining ourselves and trimming the fat, cutting away things out of our life which are just pointless and of no eternal value. And again, another thought I had, and 
mercifully from the Lord I've been spared a lot of this but you'll understand that time is finite if you've experienced the death of a loved one or someone close to you turn to Psalm 90 verse 12 Psalm 90 verse 12 So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. We don't have forever. We've only got a certain amount of time down here. Time to help other Christians. Time to spread the truth. Time to preach the gospel and witness to our families. And again, it's finite. We have to number our days. We're not wasting time. We're not killing time. We're not... um, as the world likes to do. There's so many things out there the world will cater to you if you want to waste time, all these games, attractions, distractions. But again, it's a really sobering thing to think that you're, gonna, you're not going to be here one day. So again, we were to walk carefully. And Job 7 verse 6. Job 7 verse 6. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Well, as Christians, we've got hope, unlike Job back then. But the point remains, my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. I was thinking, you know, I've been at this church now for about a year and a half and it has just absolutely flown by. I cannot believe it. It's quite scary, actually. And as you get older, it seems to me at least that your perception of time just... Things just seem to go quicker and quicker. When you're a child, you have six weeks off school and the holiday. It seems to be, to drag out forever, but it's f- quite frightening as you get older how your perspective on time changes. So again, don't waste time. Another topic I wanted to talk about was laziness. And I suppose, you know, I'm certainly guilty of this. <laughs> I don't know about you at times, but again, laziness is something that we've really got to fight um, the flesh wants to be lazy. It doesn't want to do anything. It wants to just be comfortable and uh, ple- be pleased and just not to do the things that we ought to do. And we have to really fight against that and make sure we're using every minute God gives us for something profitable. So what is Webster's definition of laziness? I always go to Webster's 1828. I find it quite useful. Laziness is indisposition to action or exertion Indolence, sluggishness, heaviness in motion, and habitual sloth. And I went down a bit of a trail on this, looking through the Bible on slothfulness, laziness, and the Bible speaks an awful lot about this. Proverbs 6, verse 6 to 11, we'll have a look at that. Proverbs 6, 6 to 11. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth and thy want as an armed man. Again, we have to work hard whilst we can. There's a couple layers of meaning to this. People on a physical, practical level, you know, we, we work hard whilst we're able to because one day we're going to struggle to as, as we get old or if, if we're crippled by illness or come what may, we have, to, we have to use what time we've got now and what capabilities we have now for things that are profitable. But on a spiritual level, we're not always going to be here you know, we are in the summer, you know, we're able to work, but there's going to be a time when we're not going to be here anymore, we're not going to be able to do the Lord's work to, to get the gospel out, to do things which are profitable. So we have to make the most use of time that we can. Turn to Proverbs 26, 13 to 18. Proverbs 26, 13 to 18. The slothful man saith, there is a lion in the way, a lion is in the streets. As the door turneth upon his hinges, 
so doth the slothful upon his bed. The slothful hideth his hand in his bosom, it grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. He that passeth by and meddleth with strife belonging not to him is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. Okay, I don't think the last verse was particularly relevant to the point I'm trying to make, but if we go through some of these verses. The slothful man saith, there is a lion in the way, a lion is in the streets. Again, we know lazy people make excuses, they exaggerate, they make things up, they just, they just say things, um, anything they can to get out of doing work and doing the things they're supposed to do. So again, we're not to be like that. Don't make excuses. You know, people can see through it. We can see through it. Just do what you're called to do. Play your part. As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. Again, lazy people spending too much time in bed, too much time not doing anything. Um, again, we're to be active. We, we need sleep, but let's be doing things. The slothful hideth his hand in his bosom, it grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. Again, we've all met sponges and lazy people who are not providing for themselves. They're being lazy, they're, they're going nowhere, they're you know, not motivated to do anything, and as a consequence of that, they're causing themselves problems. Like this guy, is, it, he's grieving him to bring his hand to his mouth, he's not feeding himself. Lazy people cause themselves problems and they cause other people problems because people have to step in to look after them. It's annoying, it's frustrating. And you'll have dealt with lazy people at work, perhaps some of you have employed la lazy people, some of you know lazy people, and for the most part they're very unpleasant and their laziness affects other people. So it's be working hard for the Lord and we're just trying to avoid working with lazy people if we can, because they'll just drag you down and cause you problems. The sluggard, this is verse 16, the sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. Again, a lot of the time, lazy people have an answer for everything. They'll come up with excuses, and it's very frustrating and unpleasant if you're dealing with these people. Turn to Proverbs 10:26. Proverbs 10, 26. A couple more verses on this. As vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to them that send him. Again, just what we talked about. Lazy people causing other people problems. If, if you're being served by someone who's being lazy, it's very unpleasant. And again, it's in the eyes of God, it's, it's quite abominable. We're to work hard and go the extra mile. In everything that we're doing. Proverbs 13 verse 4. Proverbs 13 verse 4. The soul of the sluggard desireth and have nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. The soul of the sluggard desireth. And this made me think of, of the UK, of a lot of European nations in particular. We're, we're very big on this welfare culture. We're big on handouts and giving and giving to those that come over here, a lot of people come here because of that and you know it's, it's, it's quite an ungodly system to take from those who are working, who are you know, being entrepreneurial, who are going the extra mile to provide for their families and loved ones and giving to those who can't be bothered to work. You know, I, I think you know, in terms of benefits and all that sort of stuff they should be given to those who can't work and not those who won't work. It just brings everyone down when you have to take from those who are doing their bit to pick up the slack for those who are being lazy. And God doesn't like that either. Turn to Proverbs 20 verse 4. Proverbs 20 verse 4. The sluggard will not plough by reason of the cold, therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. Again, we've all met people like this who make excuses, they're not going to work, they're not going to study, they're not going to do what they need to do, that they're, they're complaining, you know, it's, that they're just making any excuse they can to be lazy, and therefore when it comes to, ha to needing something, they don't have it because they haven't worked to get it. And a lot of the time, people, especially in our, you know, in our country, it really makes me sick, to be quite honest with you, 
that people are just so entitled and they think you know they didn't they they should be given everything a house food clothing when you know we're not entitled to anything you've got to go out there and get it and I think it's it's a real shame that we, we cater to these people and a lot of Christians get suckered into this people um, people are begging money and, and begging handouts and it's, it's like a bottomless pit you can give and give and give but it's just never enough you have to have some wisdom and discernment to those who you want to help out and to those who are asking for help are they genuinely in a difficult situation or is this a lesson they're having to learn because they've made some poor decisions some unscriptural decisions some basically choices that have led them to where they are today I don't know, I guess you've got to assess it on a case-by-case basis. Turn to Proverbs 15, verse 19. Proverbs 15, verse 19. The way of the slothful man is as a hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. Again, don't take shortcuts. Uh, people who are lazy take shortcuts and it causes them pain. <laughs> The way of the slothful man is a hedge of, horn, of thorns. They, they get into problems because they're, they're cutting corners. They're not doing things properly. They might be breaking the law in order to cut a corner. And again, it's going to cause them pain. But if you do things properly, your way is going to be straight. A lot of people want the, uh, the outcome, the end result, without putting the effort in. But uh, again... It's, it's, not how, it's not the way it's supposed to be. Turn to Proverbs 21, 25. Proverbs 21, 25. The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labour. Again, the desire of the slothful. There's a lot of lazy people want a lot of things, but they're not willing to do what it takes to get these things. You know, a, lot, a lot of lazy people, you know, they, want, they want a nice car, so... They get into massive, massive amounts of debts and payments they can't afford, or they, they want a big house now, and they want all this stuff right now. But as a consequence, they cause themselves problems. We, we live in a culture where nobody wants to put any effort in, but they want the end result now, whereas perhaps many years ago, people would work hard and put the time in and actually you know, realise what it is they want. And again... You just see on the news every day people stealing from each other, people stabbing, people doing all sorts of things to, to get things they want without doing things honestly in the right way. You know, back when I first got saved, um, <laughs> I was listening to a charismatic preacher, it made me laugh. People want, he said, they want the glory but not the story. It's a bit cheesy, but they, they, want, the, uh, they want what you have or what other people have. They cover after things that they don't have. But they don't want to. They don't want the pain and the effort and the sweat that comes with going out to get it. Turn to one Timothy five, verse eleven to thirteen. One Timothy five, verse eleven to thirteen. And this verse is, in particular, aimed at, at women. But I suppose you can also apply this to men. With the point I'm trying to make here. But the younger widows refuse. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation, because they have cast off their first faith. And withal, they learn to be idle. They learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. Verse 13. There's a phrase, isn't there? There's a saying that the devil makes work for idle hands. And again, in this verse, the Apostle Paul, he's basically saying these women, they're getting into trouble because they've got too much time on their hands. They're getting involved in things they ought not to be getting involved with because they're not using their time wisely. They've got too much spare time. And as we all know, people get into trouble when they've got too much time on their hands. You know, teenagers do stupid things. They get into all sorts of trouble because, I don't know, they're off school or whatever. But even ourselves, you look at people who end up in court, in jail, things like that. You know, those who are working hard and don't have much time, we quite frankly don't have time to get involved with a lot of sin and problems that people with too much time on their hands get involved with. 
So make yourself busy and make sure that you don't have idle hands. We're doing profitable things. You'll stay out of a lot more sin that way. Proverbs 19.15. Go back to Proverbs 19.15. Appreciate I'm jumping around quite a bit today. Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. Again, slothfulness, casting into a deep sleep, you know, being lazy, being sluggish, causing yourself problems, you know, an idle soul shall suffer hunger. You're hungry because you're not working hard, you could put more effort in. Don't be lazy, don't cause yourself problems, don't cause other people problems, pull your weight. Ecclesiastes 10.18 Ecclesiastes 10.18 By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. I've got a couple layers of meaning to this. You know, physically, practically, I guess you could call it. You've got to take care of your things, you've got to take care of your possessions. Everything, most things that we have require maintenance. Your house, you've got to clean it, look after it. Your garden, whatever you've got, your property, your business, even your body, we have to take time to Look after it, otherwise things decay, fall apart. So look after what God's given you to look after. You know your body's the temple of the Lord, temple of the Holy Ghost, to look after it. Not to get obsessed like these uh, people do today, but just take care of what you have. But also, on a, on a kind of spiritual level, it's a bit of an admonition because the more possessions we accumulate, the more things we own and take ownership of through covetousness we get things we don't need it's going to take more time away from us you know i think in in my family for example i've some my grandparents are very wealthy and they've got a very large property in spain and because they're, they're so old now they're in their late 80s they're not able to go over there and it's all just going to pot there's weeds there's the cars are just not in a good position there's dust everywhere and people, they, they accumulate more and more and more. And as you get older, you have less energy to take care of it. Yet, that's kind of the way the world goes, isn't it? You work hard, you get this big pension, you retire, get your gold watch. And you have all these uh, you know, holiday homes here and there. But how long can you really enjoy it for? And how much stress and problems does it cause them? I don't know, but have some wisdom. Don't get, don't get caught into that trap. Turn to Romans twelve eleven. Romans 12, 11. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Again, for Christians, this is for us. When we're working, we're not to be lazy. We're to work hard. We're to be a good testimony. We're to show the lost world that we've got something. We're working hard. We're, we've been a blessing to those around us, to our families. We're doing what we're doing for the Lord. Second Thessalonians three ten. Second uh, Thessalonians three ten. For for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. We've we've talked about this, the country that we live in. I don't know what it is and what it's like in America. I'm sure they're a bit stricter, but. Uh, Again, this is kind of how God sees things and how as Christians we're to see things. If we can't, if we're, if we're able to work and we're not doing it, then you're not going to get, you're not going to get the things you need. You're going to cause yourself problems, you're going to cause other problems. So take care of, you, take care of yourself and that way you'll become less of a burden to others and you'll be able to give more and be a blessing to missionaries, to other Christians, to profitable things. And this is an interesting uh, next sort of section I had to look at was where work first appeared in the Bible. And I thought this was quite interesting. Turn to Genesis 2, 7 to 15. Genesis 2, 7 to 15. And this is right in the beginning when the Lord's making uh, Adam the first man. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. 
And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is, it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is Bedellion and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidekal. That is, it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And this is the key verse, really. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So, going back to verse 7. God's made man, he's breathed, into the, he's breathed into his nostrils and he's become a living soul. And the next thing man does, he's put to work. The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. He's doing things, he's active, he's got a purpose. He's, um, it's the way God intended it to be, it's, it's part of life. And then if we look after the fall, so obviously Eve takes the fruit and... Uh, Adam also does so, and mankind falls into sin, and it's never been the same. If we turn to Genesis 3:19, this is after the fall. One of the curses that man is under now because of sin, the Lord says here, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it thou for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt, re- shalt thou return. You know, works hard now. We eat from the, the sweat of our, um, from our face and it's tiring, it requires effort and we've got to do it until we can't do it anymore and it's part of the, the curse we're under, the sin curse. Perhaps one day it won't be so bad once the curse is lifted, once we get our resurrection bodies, once we're the Lord. Turn to Ephesians 5.16. Ephesians 5.16 And again this is practical verses for us today and how we're to manage our time, how we're to live redeeming the time because the days are evil they're very evil we have to make sure we're, we're busy we're doing things, we're keeping out of sin the more we're doing that the less likely we are to get in sin and the more we're going to have at the judgment seat of Christ if we're investing our time into profitable things Turn back to Genesis 47.6. I know we've, um, recently in our Bible study, we've touched upon this verse and it's stuck in my mind. I, I quite like this one. Genesis 47.6. The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land, make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen, let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle, God's choosing the men of activity, the people who are active, who are working, who are getting things done. And as Christians, we're gonna, we want to be like that. So maybe God will bless us and help us to, you know, be more responsible, to be more productive and fruitful as Christians. Turn to Romans eight six. Romans eight six. And again, we're not to be caught up in work on a secular level. Yes, we have to do it, but we do it for a purpose. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And a lot of people we work with, a lot of people who are working crazy hours in the city or whatever, they're carnally minded. You know, they're, they're some of those depressed people you'll meet, doctors, lawyers, professionals, you know, that a lot of them have problems with depression, suicide, alcohol, drug, drug abuse, all that bad stuff, because they, they just don't have time to think, to reflect on life, to question life. Why are we here? Is there a creator? They're just so wrapped up in the here and now, the cares of this world, that, um, you know, that they're kindly minded. It's death. It's very sad, and I'm sure some of you, before you got saved, were 
in that kind of system, in that kind of mindset. I know I personally was. But again, we're not to be like that. We're to be spiritually minded. And that way we're going to have life and peace. We're not just on, on, in the rat race. We're not just on the hamster wheel. We're doing things for the Lord. There is a purpose. There is a plan. We're doing things to please Him. And that way, work becomes a lot more bearable. Turn to Matthew eleven twenty eight. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Again, the Lord Jesus Christ is our rest. He is our comfort. We don't have to go to all these crutches the modern world leads upon um, all sorts of vices and sin and distractions. We, we go to the Lord when we need rest, and he'll take care of us. Romans 16 to 18. Romans 16 to 18. Romans 16 18. And this is talking about the vast majority of people today. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. Most people, the vast majority of people, are not working for the Lord Jesus Christ, but for their own belly. And by good words and fair speech, to deceive the hearts of the simple. We're not to be deceived. And even amongst Christians or professing Christians, a lot of them, they have great big ministries, great big, uh, I don't know, businesses you'd call them. Um, and they're not, their motive isn't right. They're not working to please the Lord, to serve Him. They just, they're in it for themselves. Don't waste your money upon these people and don't get suckered into these people. Don't waste your time with these people. I know we probably all have been through naivety, but we're to have some wisdom and discernment as we mature in the Lord. So, to close, we're to work hard, we're to not be lazy, we're to fight the flesh when we want to be lazy, we're to, we're to get up, we're to go, we're to have a plan, we have things to achieve for the day, for the Lord, we're to work so we can be a blessing to others, we work hard, we can take care of others if we can, we're to put our time into things that are profitable, not to waste time on things that are just going to be wood, hay and stubble at the judgment seat of Christ and we're to enjoy every day and make the most of the time God gives us and to be thankful to him for every day he sends us. We're obviously all still here, he still has work for us to do and we're to make every day count because we don't know how long we've got left, not only with ourselves but with each other as well. Let's not waste time together and do the Lord's work. Let's pray.